We will now move on to the first panel discussion of the day, which is on current challenges in international arbitration and the role of arbitral institutions. As the name suggests, in this session, the esteemed panel will take stock of the current challenges facing international arbitration and the role that arbitral institutions can play in light of these challenges. I would now like to invite the speakers to the stage. We are greatly honored to have with us as panelists Mr. V.K. Raja, SC, International Arbitrator, Duxton Hill Chambers. Mr. Raja, if, if I could request you to come on stage. We also have with us Ms. Sheila Ahuja, Partner, India Group, Allen & Overy. Mr. Arjun Krishnan, Partner, Samvad Partners. Mr. Pranav Mago, Director, International Arbitration, Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas. Mr. Krishnayan Sen, partner, Luthra and Luthra Law Offices, India. This discussion will be moderated by our registrar, Kevin Nash. Ah, that's better. I was going to start with a discussion of technology, but I, I will amend that now. Um, thank you so much for being here. It is so good to be back in Delhi. Uh, one of my former colleagues, uh, when, when I saw him in the hall, said, welcome home. Uh, and consistent with what the chairman said, the minister, there is this relationship between SIC and India, between Singapore and India. We've administered thousands uh, of cases uh, involving Indian parties uh, and it is an important jurisdiction to us. So what we're intending to do on this panel is to talk about current challenges in international arbitration and the role of an arbitral institution. So with current challenges, the easy answer might be a lot. There are a lot of challenges with arbitration, and there are many different options that you have in dispute resolution. And I think the role of the arbitral institution has changed as well. So the Chief Justice of Singapore famously had said that institutions have moved from mere stewards to the true thought leaders in arbitration. So there's a different mandate for an institution. And I can even see it, a difference in the population of the SIC Secretariat. So we are very pleased to have two of our Indian qualified counsel here who bring proper experience. So I think that maybe 20 years ago, you might have had non-lawyers, lay people, they are doing the administration of the case. So uh, what we're called upon to do at an institution is quite a bit different. Now, my idea for this, for this panel is to make it fast-paced and lively. I think some of the panelists have indicated that they have lots of questions for me as well. And so we're going to run through some of the different topics. So we'll look at the role of the institution, uh, appointments, diversity, challenges to arbitrators. We always have to have some crystal ball gazing, and then we'll try to leave some time at the end for uh, question and answer. So if I could start by perhaps putting it to any of the panelists, and because all of you are bringing perspective from uh, independent arbitrator, uh, counsel, uh, what is the role of the institution? What does the institution mean for you, and what do you need from an institution? Why are we choosing institutional arbitrations, say, as compared to ad hoc arbitration? And I will open it to any panelist who wants to comment. Uh, uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, before I start, may I say how pleased I am to be back here. Uh, I just met Min, um, who most of you won't know. Um, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, um, he was doing Kevin's job, and we had the first sessions here with Indian members of the uh, Indian legal profession. There was no real international arbitration focus group at that point of time. There were some uh, Indian practitioners, and the Indian bar had an international uh, uh, grouping. Uh, but um, within the wider legal landscape, uh, international arbitration was still nascent. I remember uh, when we were trying to persuade um, members of the Indian legal profession to use the SIC instead of the LCIA, which was then more popular. Um, Pallavi asked the question, I was then an uh, appellate judge, 
why should we use Singapore? Why don't we stay in India? So my response was, if you can stay in India, by all means do. But let us be your second choice, your favorite second choice. And I'm really pleased to see, 20 years on, um, Singapore is by a clear margin the favorite or favored second choice for Indian parties. Indeed, I was just analyzing over the last decade um, the usage or users of the SIC. And um, by an overwhelming margin, uh, Indian users are the largest users of arbitration or the SIAC in Singapore. For example, last year's statistics, um, 194 parties from India. The next best was China, 87. And then it dropped off. Um, now let me get to the heart of what I want to say about the usage of arbitration. Give me a few minutes and in institutions. I'm going to be mildly provocative because in Singapore we have a term, hard truths. And um, we are among friends and I'm going to be quite direct. So among the 10 highest users of the SIAC, eight are Asian. This was last year's statistics. Number four, I think, was the US, and number seven was the Ukraine. They had never figured before, um, so I, I guess there is a reason why uh, the Ukraine, and Kevin can probably explain it. Uh, hopefully it's not one-off, but it's good to know that they see Singapore as a neutral area. So, Asian work, is really important to the SIC. And I would say, ex-China and Hong Kong, the SIAC is today the preferred and the leading arbitral center in Asia. But that in itself is not enough. Let me be very candid. Because in my view, the landscape in Asia is very different from what it was 20 years ago 10 years ago. And the biggest change, in my view, and I've had a fair amount of interactions in the last five years, not so much in the last two years except over Zoom, the biggest change are the two superpowers in Asia, economic superpowers, India and China. There's been an amazing growth in India as well as in China. I look around. It is dominated today by younger faces. Not just younger faces, extremely able faces. I was commenting to one of my Indian friends. I read Indian arbitration blogs quite often. And I just read a blog on the case that Justice Carl was referring to, Michael and uh, King and Cox, where I think the Supreme Court said that we need to review the earlier decision in Chloro. And it was an extremely well-written article written by a third-year law student. And that's the kind of quality you have. With a population this big and this many able people interested in arbitration, you are going to produce thought leaders, not just in India, but, and not just in Asia, but globally. And this is where we have a problem today, a real problem, not just with Asian institutions, but global institutions. And the problem is diversity. And, and part of it is our fault. It is our fault because we are not at the table. We are not visible. We are not engaging with international bodies. We are not represented on international bodies. I'm talking now as an Asian, not as a Singaporean. And I've spent a great deal of time, I have a little more time reading up books like Sashi Thoros, Inglorious Empire, um, the Harvard historian Karen Elkins, her book on colonialism, uh, the legacy of violence, and so on. And it is really interesting that we now look at all the arbitral institutions and ask ourselves, to whom are they accountable? Because they publish statistics. The statistics so far have been focused on how many cases they do. 
but they don't really publish statistics on how efficient they are. How long do they take to clear applications? How long do they take to address problems or disputes? Or neither do they set KPIs. So what I see as changing are two things. User equity, and uh, it's a term that I, I, I found the most suitable. And the second is institutional accountability. What I mean by user equity? So the point that I, or the fact that I referred to earlier, that Asian parties are now significant players, not just with the SIIC, with the ICC too. 25% of the ICC disputes are Asian-based parties, but the appointments is only 10%. Um, and uh, that itself raises figures. And this is something I have brought up with the ICC. Similarly, I think as far as the SIEC is concerned, by far the major amount of its users, I, I dare say up to three quarters would be Asians. But in terms of appointments, and these figures are not very clear, but they appear to be institutional and partly party appointed arbitrators, Singaporeans are first. The second, I think, with about 116. The second are the British, with about 110. And then there's a big drop to Australians, the Americans, and finally the Indians. So the Indians are again underrepresented. I think this should change, because I think perhaps 10 years ago, 20 years ago, there were an insufficient number of Indians with sufficient experience and bandwidth. And let me also be direct. Indian retired Supreme Court judges, not the present ones, I've worked with a number of them, but in the past were not known for their efficiency. And uh, that, I think, created a problem with institutions. So some of the institutions have not updated their software. And I think we should really be looking at a greater number of appointments coming from within Asia, from India, perhaps also from China and elsewhere. But um, so I'm going to stop here because I don't want to overstay my welcome. But I want you to remember two, these two things, user equity and institutional accountability. So who's going to ask for institutional accountability? And that's part of the problem. So the ICC, the LCIA, SIAC, and the other institutions at the moment are only accountable internally. There are no users who really press them for accountability. I see change taking place in two areas. First, the national law firms, the national law firms will in time get together and they will ask to have a dialogue between these institutions and them. The second body will be the corporate council associations in these different countries, uh, especially India and China. And they too will be asking for dialogues and the institutions which are not prepared for this dialogue will find themselves disadvantaged. The competition between institutions today is not on rules because each of them very quickly will follow the rules that the others may have, whether it's on emergency arbitrators or whether it's on early dismissals or whether it's on jointer. The competition, in my view, is going to be on efficiency and productivity. And the first institutions that recognize this are going to have a head start. Who is that going to be? I leave that to the rest of the panel. Anyone want to provide observations? Uh, a lot of good, good ideas and topics there. So if, if, if I may uh, just continue from where uh, Mr. Raja left, and I think it's a number of very important points which, which did come out. It's a good problem to have that because the popularity of arbitration in the past decade in this part of the world, especially in this country, has increased so much. So it's a good problem to have, but one of the problems still, the challenges still remain, is the development of the pool of arbitrators, which I think so is pretty much what, what Mr. Raja just covered. Now, while, uh, Kevin, you asked that as, as counsel now, what we would expect when we go to an institution for appointment of an arbitrator. And uh, having previously worn the hat of an institution representative myself, of course, my expectations are slightly higher. And uh, so, 
the, the neutrality, the independence of, of any of the appointed arbitrators, whether it's a sole uh, tribunal or whether it's a party, and that's, that means the other side as well, the other party also nominating an arbitrator. Of course, the natural expectation, which has always been and will continue to remain, is the neutrality and independence of, of any of these uh, appointed, appointed arbitrators. And hence, the role of the institution becomes extremely important in, in that as well. Second is that I would expect that there would be amongst the seniority as well, while it is considered a subject matter expert as to which particular industry a dispute relates to. In order for the particular nominated or appointed arbitrator is able to grasp the problem, the grasp the issue at hand much faster, which of course then relates to one of the age old challenges, which is speed and, and the cost of the arbitration as well, something which the Honorable Minister also pointed out in, in his speech. So that would be the natural expectations that when, when any of us as counsel on behalf of our clients, we would be going to an institution for appointment of a tribunal, appointment of, a, uh, of, of an arbitrator. These would be the uh, points that we would expect the institution has already considered and there is no issue regarding that, which would then bring me to one question which I would have to you as to how do, what do you think is the role of the arbitral institutions in developing this pool further? And not just, uh, while of course I, I, I know this, that there is a panel of arbitrators, but SIAC doesn't necessarily have to stick to that panel. But as institutions, do you think it becomes the responsibility of the institution to further develop these, this pool of arbitration, arbitrators as well, so that there is more choice to the parties? Just to add, uh, one common problem which Indian practitioners have is certainly one of discipline. Uh, uh, because Indian, most of the Indian arbitrations are still continues to be uh, ad hoc arbitrations. And uh, while you have uh, arbitrators who are essentially retired judges of uh, both the High Court and sometimes Supreme Court, the, the critical issue that comes uh, for the users is one of discipline. Because uh, we still pretty much have a culture of evening sittings, usually, or weekend sittings. And, uh, and one of the reasons why users would want to come to an institution uh, as opposed to an ad hoc is that if they can get some certainty over disciplining your arbitrators, uh, scheduling the sessions. I've had uh, uh, an ICA in an uh, oil uh, arbitration where the client was coming all the way from the US for an arbitration at Guwahati, which is in the eastern side of India. And uh, the, the session, the arbitrator would only sit for uh, two hours and, and that's it. Uh, he would bring a secretary who, would, uh, who was his daughter, and, and, and he's a retired uh, Chief Justice. So how do you discipline these kind of conducts? And uh, the only time in the, when the secretary wasn't present was when uh, uh, she was substituted by, uh, by his son-in-law. So, so that's the real kind of issues that we face. Uh, repeated adjournments. Uh, so, uh, so that's my take on that. Just a just a quick follow up. Did that uh, daughter uh, issue a statement of independence and impartiality, given the familial relationship? Yeah. In fact, uh, so so uh, usually what would happen is he would take your consent. He would say he would look at both the parties and said, would would any of you have any objection if my daughter acts as a tribunal secretary? It's it is an ICA. And, uh, and as a council, um, most councils would say we don't have a problem, even when the problem is apparent, uh, just because you don't want to uh, rub him on the wrong side. So, so that's, that, these are the practical challenges that Indian practitioners face. There's no doubt that some of those mechanisms, the reason why you choose the institution, say if you have arbitrators that are taking a relatively leisure, leisurely schedule for sitting, uh, you don't want to uh, have to push the tribunal from, from one side, and that's when the institution can come in. But as VK is saying, that if you're losing these efficiency advantages from institutional arbitration, then the message that we're trying to deliver in India and around the world, that institutional arbitration makes arbitration more efficient and actually costs less, starts to lose some of its weight. But I wanted to touch on VK's point about user equity, and to me I think that you can also add to this a, a shifting in the axis of arbitration to Asia. Uh, Sheila, you work on very high profile cases, uh, Indian users, do you notice more bargaining powers from your clients and that your clients are actually gonna be a bit more discriminating on the institution that they select? 
uh, because they can move the clause or the type of dispute resolution that they're choosing. Thanks, Kevin. Um, first of all, it's great to be here, and it's actually great to be back in in-person conferences, particularly in India, which obviously, after doing them for many, many years, um, I thought I would be sick of it, and then I found myself missing it for the last 36 months, so I'm very happy to be back here. Um, uh, and another just side comment is, of the long-running disputes that I have been doing, there is one particular one that has been going on for so long that I have told my daughters that they will take over, actually. <laughs> so now I've got some support for that proposition, which I shall go home and convey to them. Um, to go to your point about um, user equity, actually I thought Mr. Raja's two um, sort of themes really resonated with what I wanted to say, and thank you for giving me some structure to what otherwise would have been an, quite an unstructured um, streams of consciousness. Um, the first is user equity and then institutional accountability. I think with user equity, um, over years we do, you know, we're a law firm, right? So we go around talking about arbitration, and then we try and remind our clients, we're not just saying you should arbitrate, we also try and tell you how to avoid arbitration. Um, and one of the slides I used to put up all the time was a comparison, no offense, Kevin, but a comparison of all the institutions. You did say I could be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, a comparison we're encouraging of all, that here. Thanks. Um, he won't talk to me after this. Um, it was a comparison of all the institutions and how much they would charge. And I started becoming more honest, you know, over my years of practice and just life, right? And there's no time for lies. And they would ask me, okay, so what's the difference in these institutions? Should we pick the one that's the cheapest? And, you know, when you're sort of younger and you sort of think, yeah, okay, I need to give them a view, you start to dig into this question and think about what the costs of the institution are and how that impacts the choice. But then what I realized was that actually, and I, I, I tell clients this, that it doesn't matter because more than 80% of your costs is us, <laughs> is your lawyers. And whether you want us to act for you in a litigation or an arbitration seated wherever, and whoever you choose as an institution, it's gonna be nothing compared to the bills you're gonna start getting from the lawyers who appear for you. So then they said, okay, well then what's the difference between the institutions? Why do I pick one over the other? And by the way, let's talk about ANO's fees later. Um, and then you get to um, accountability. And actually, I heard the, the very sort of, I thought, very inspiring speeches this morning from Justice Call and the Honorable Minister. And one of the things that, uh, that, that happened throughout those speeches, of course, was the theme of you know, how we can be more efficient. And in particular, in the Indian context, what um, changes have taken place in the last few years back before the 2002, sort of 2012 line of cases where we were talking about when are things gonna change. And then what we saw is a series of rapid changes and Justice Call took us through them, I thought, very nicely. Um, but what I think is, what one has to ask is, how does that, and to Mr. Raja's point, how does that correlate to actual matters? So when we are running arbitrations, how much do we say has changed as a result of all these changes at a higher level? And of course, our clients like to hold us accountable, and then we go, and as part of our careers, we think, well, how do I divert that blame to someone else, right? So, you know, you can put that in a more professional manner, I suppose. Um, and one of the things that I think we could do is put the blame more on institutions in, in the form of pressure to try and create more rigor in the process. And there were many suggestions, and I, I had a list of suggestions, actually, of whether you can reduce the time for the constitution of the tribunal. I think CX actually incredibly quick. So do you have to put 30 days in your rules, or can you test yourself a bit more on that, the way that our clients sometimes tell us to do in our contracts? Um, page limits for pleadings. Um, does document production really need to exist at all? Um, and if so, can it be more limited? And should we just forego with procedural hearings? Then I got to procedural hearings and I decided actually that I don't agree with because I've never done a case where, or, or let me put that sentence again. There are two types of cases I've done in my limited career. One is where you have a disengaged tribunal and then the procedural conference, it may or may not have happened, just didn't matter. And before COVID, it was more about the trip uh, than the actual conference. Um, and then Zoom, it was completely pointless, I felt, in 90% of the cases. And what you'd end up getting is the same old procedure, which I can almost draft for them before the hearings even started. And lo and behold, if I then ran a comparison or asked my daughter to do so, they probably wouldn't find many changes. The second type of cases are where the tribunal is engaged. 
And then what you find yourself doing is at the end of the procedural hearing, you think, oh, that was tougher than I thought for a procedural hearing. And then I realized that actually the start of the matter is much more important than people think. And I feel like this has been said a lot, but nothing changes. And that's because, Kevin, I think that institutions can think about putting more pressure on tribunals up front. And one of my concrete suggestions, which I promise I'm now coming to, is a list of issues. And I did a little bit of homework, and I tried to look at all the institutional rules to see what they say about what happens once the tribunal's constituted. And they talk about, you know, you must um, come up with the most efficient procedure, and uh, you must talk about you know, the timetable, and it has to be efficient, fair, all these terms that directly correlate to the New York Convention, they're all there. But what it doesn't do is tell you how. It tells you then you file a statement of claim, you file a defense, what you put in it, you know, relief, okay? <laughs> Gives you a lot of detail on that stuff. But what I think it should do is say, when you have a procedural conference, the tribunal needs to agree a list of issues. And in that, if there is a preliminary issue, that is the time to flag it. Because otherwise, what you're doing is you're leaving it to procedural discretion. A tribunal that's not engaged sees that as, you know, this is just something I got to do because I got appointed. That's great. And then I issue the PO1 and I carry on in life until the merits hearing. And by the way, when pleadings are served and you need that 30-day password to download them, it always expires, right? Because no one downloads it until the merits hearing. And then you think, oh, could you resend it? There's one missing document, which is code for, I just didn't open this stuff until the hearing. But then if you have a list of issues specifically on the agenda, I think compelled by the institution, and this is why I keep on looking at you, I mean, this is SIAC, it's a conference, so I feel I can. Um, is if you had that in your list of things that the tribunal should put on the table, including a preliminary issue, then it does two things. One is the counsel engage, because, I mean, I'm sitting here blaming the arbitrators, but let's face it, sometimes even counsel walk in, is that procedure? No problem, I can do six of those in a day. Actually, simultaneously, often, if it's Zoom. Um, but if you really want your counsel to get the best procedure for you, don't they also need to know what your case is right from day one? So I think the list of issues should be imposed on counsel first. And then, of course, if the tribunal gets it too, you know, there's a procedural issue here, which is what is the meaning of this clause? That then guides, you know, how the rest of the arbitration goes and often actually leads to settlement even, or a talk of settlement. I think that will change. In my head, it's completely game-changing. In reality, I think it'll move the needle a little bit. That's what I want to Sheila, say. you keep looking at me, but I keep agreeing with everything that you're saying. <laughs> uh, it's almost uh, a question of whose arbitration is it. There are a lot of actors in this play, and in order for this play to run efficiently, you have to have everyone looking, working together. I'm always reminded uh, of a survey where you asked in-house counsel how long an arbitration should take, and then you asked disputes lawyers. And the gap was enormous. So an in-house lawyer might say, I don't know, three months. And then a disputes lawyer would say, oh, no, 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 18 months, maybe two years. And that's where arbitration has really changed. And that's one of the current challenges. I think the timelines that were OK five years ago, uh, 10 years ago, maybe are not OK in 2022. Arjun, I just want to uh, perhaps go to you and get your view uh, from the ground. Who should be making arbitrations uh, more efficient? And what is the interaction between all of the actors in this institutional arbitration play? So I'll, I'll pick up uh, two points from what Sheila said and what Mr. Raja said. Uh, and I look at it slightly differently. I ask myself, why do I recommend an institution to my client? And according to me, at least in the Indian context and particularly in the context of international commercial arbitration, there are three reasons. Firstly, the procedural discipline that the rules bring. Secondly, I have a good ball ballpark idea of what it's going to cost me, not necessarily all legal costs, but at least what the arbitrator's fee is going to be, what the administrative costs are. And the third is, of course, uh, appointments. And I think this is where institutions score uh, over Indian courts, at, at, and particularly in, the, in international commercial arbitration, because we have a huge problem of appointments in India. Uh, and compared to, say, uh, the speed at which SIAC would act, I'll just give you some, uh, some figures. Um, all international uh, commercial arbitration appointments have to go to the Supreme Court of India. The fact remains that 
out of 55 cases that were filed for appointments in the Supreme Court in 2019, 22 are still pending. And out of 42 that were filed in 2020, 16 are still pending. That's, I think, uh, a staggering figure. But let's take a step back. What are the two or three things that have been solved or can be solved in Indian arbitration? And then let's look at why institutions are important or will institutions slowly cease to have relevance? We have, at some level, solved the problem of costs in India because at least as far as domestic arbitration is concerned, you have a fourth schedule with a uh, schedule of fee. Everybody may not be happy about it, but that's what it is. Uh, you also, if you appoint arbitrators like Sheila or Mr. Raja, you will get procedural discipline because as Sheila said, she can probably write the first procedural order in her sleep. And what would happen if the third problem were to be solved of appointments? What is the value of the institution then? So this is my question to you, Kevin, uh, and I would request you to give us your thoughts on this. I think what users want from an institution is predictability and commercial certainty. So they have voted with the power of their pen to choose SIC arbitration, and we expect SIC arbitration to be conducted in a certain way. And we also expect that you're going to appoint a, a certain type of arbitrators. The appointment of arbitrators is absolutely critical to the running of an arbitration. As an institution, if you appoint the incorrect arbitrator or you appoint an arbitrator that's not suitable for the dispute, or even worse, could potentially shape the result of the dispute, it's impossible for the institution to have a good arbitration in, the, in that case. So, and to VK's point, if we're talking about uh, the expectation that in a global institution that happens to be based in Asia is going to be appointing Asian arbitrators that have an idea of the commercial realities in Asia, then I think that that is also an expectation from the appointment of arbitrators. But of course, as you know, we are always looking for the parties to have some input in the nomination of arbitrators, and it's only when they can't uh, come to an agreement. V VK, you had some thoughts? Yeah. Um, first, let, let me make it very clear. I, I'm not suggesting that uh, appointments should be made merely on the basis of geography or ethnicity. It must be merit-based. The point I'm making is that the major institutions, in my view, and I've spent five years looking at some of these issues, the major arbitral institutions have not updated their operating software in this area. They have not taken into account the growth, the development, the bandwidth, the depth, the breadth that is now present in this part of the world. Uh, I have sat with some of the best European, American, and Asian arbitrators. And I've heard some of the best Indian counsel, some of them who were present in the room earlier, they are probably busy, they've left. Um, I'm glad to see Justice Sen is there, I've sat with him. And I'm, I must say, the Indian arbitrators I've sat with are as good as the best in Europe and in the US in terms of their bandwidth, in terms of their diligence. But I think the institutions have not updated their software. And there is still a representation or over-representation of the traditional sources. This is something you have to do, not just because you're based in Asia, but you're doing it because it's the right thing to recognize that on merit, not because of ethnicity or geography alone, that there are people here as good, and in some areas even better, than those from the traditional sources. And I'm, I'm glad I'm here today, because I'm looking around, and I see the number of young faces. You are the future. In 10 to 15 years' time, you will be global leaders. It's inevitable. Davinda talked today about India's place in the next 10 years. But let's talk about the people, the talent, the international arbitration in India, and I must mention also China, despite the fact they have a disadvantage in terms of language. Some of them have overcome that. 
despite the fact they come from a civil law system. I've met some really impressive uh, people. This is a matter of statistics. In countries with as big a population as China and India, you're going to get a greater number of remarkable people entering the legal profession. And international arbitration is one of the most attractive areas of legal work. So, um, that, so that's the point I'm making. Second, let me emphasize, in, arbitral institutions are critical in the legal landscape. Ad hoc arbitration will always be the second choice for arbitrators because of the lack of structure, and if you have a recalcitrant party, it's going to be a real problem. So I think in the more substantial transactions, cost is the least important factor because if you're looking at the substance of the contract or the size of the contract and the parties involved, costs will not be a factor. I, I think the quality of the institution is an important consideration. So it's not by accident the SIAC and to some extent the HKIC based in Asia have been attracting good work. But my concern is this, that we shouldn't be looking at the present. We should keep looking at the future. You can't take this for granted that things will always be the same. The case of LCIA and love lost with India is an example. One can very quickly fall out of love. And I, I, I want to say to my friends in the SIC, my friends in the Indian arbitral community, this has been a wonderful marriage. And it may last for a long time in the future. But in all marriages, you need to work hard to keep it going and keep each other interested. And that is why I am emphasizing that in my view, the institutions that focus on efficiency, the institution that has the courage to publish KPIs and say, we will do this in this amount of time and be held by these standards, will be the institutions of preference in the future, whether it's going to be the LCIA, the ICC, the SIAC, the HKIC, or some Middle Eastern institution. Let's see which leadership has the courage, the drive, and the motivation to do that. That's a personal view. Thanks, VK. Just a, a few observations, and then maybe if I could put a question back to you. Um, I think that to a certain degree that we're a victim of our own success with Indian parties, because in so many cases we'll have Indian parties on one side of the dispute. So if we're appointing a sole arbitrator, that it's going to be any nationality but an Indian party and the counterparty. What we're trying to do in the SIC Secretariat, and I think that former and current members of the Secretariat will, uh, can attest to, is to make sure that we're appointing uh, the best arbitrators in the world and not confine arbitrators just to a jurisdiction. So if you're taking a jurisdiction and you're only making an appointment when it's an appointment on behalf of a non-participating party, uh, that's not how you're advancing the jurisdiction. And certainly, as our deputy counsel would know, and I've said publicly a few times, one of the most difficult jobs to get is as an Indian qualified deputy counsel in the SIC secretariat, because the quality of the CVs that we get at SIC and that I'm sure all of you get at law firms, so the depth of talent is something that we're very understanding of. And certainly, our mandate is to appoint the best in the world wherever they are in the world, but also to not be confined by antiquated ways of thinking and that we're making appointments because we used to make it this way 20 years ago, or if there's a multi-billion dollar dispute, surely we must go to the continent. No, no, we have some of the best arbitrators in the world in Asia, uh, and we are going to appoint them on those appropriate disputes. So, but VK, back to the procedural propriety of an arbitration, and of course you sit in some of the most complex cases in the world. What would you say is the role of the tribunal in ensuring that an arbitration runs smoothly, starting from, as Sheila said, say at the first CMC? Um, to be very direct, it's all about experience. And it's all about understanding where due process begins and ends. Uh, and if you have an arbitral tribunal that knows its procedural law, no, is sensitive to the case law of the seat, um, I, I think we have now a sufficient body of experienced arbitrators who will 
ensure that the arbitration is dealt with both efficiently and fairly. And the two are not mutually exclusive. It's not a binary choice. You can have a fair as well as an efficient arbitration. And sometimes that, meanings being, that means being tough with one party. I, I do know that sometimes to get a consensus, consensus with all three arbitrators, especially one of the party appointed arbitrators, may sometimes be difficult. But that's where I, I think good sense has to prevail. Because if you look for the lowest common denominator, which is consensus among all three all the time, then you may have slippages in efficiency. But I, I, I do think, which is not to say inexperienced tribunals can't do well. And this is where continuing education is really going to be important. And how we, who have more experience and who have more seniority and the institutions can play a critical part in educating and bringing up to date younger tribunals and younger members of the profession. Uh, and I think continuing education, and the, I must commend the SIC here, is critical. And you have done a good job. You're continuing to do a good job. And um, uh, that is something that helps. And I think, let me be also very candid, you need to go one extra step. I think the institutions need to give back to the countries that they have the closest relationship with. And what do I mean by giving back? Helping the ecosystem, helping to train the next generation of lawyers, working with the universities on master course, on courses on uh, perhaps masters of laws, diplomas of laws, working with the best universities. And I think here, to be very direct, Singapore can do better. We need to work with your top institutions and produce not in Singapore, but in India, a greater number of uh, legal graduates who wish to specialize in international arbitration, because not all of them can afford the cost of coming here. So I do hope that we see greater partnership, greater contributions from the SIAC and Singapore Incorporated to India. Maybe if we, this is an important topic, uh, the appointment of arbitrators, and maybe if we could start down the line Krish, with you and talk about just th what matters to your clients on, a, on appointments, how much uh, stake should users have in the appointment process, and then we can then uh, move into challenges to arbitrators. What, what are you seeing? What's the, the so, state of play? Uh, so I think the uh, real challenge is uh, in sectors in when it's a specialized field well, it's a construction arbitration or an oil and gas arbitration, to find an arbitrator with, who has specialized domain knowledge on that area. Uh, I, I know it's very fashionable, uh, at least in India, to uh, criticize judges, uh, high court judges, Supreme Court judges, uh, for their inefficiency, uh, which uh, uh, Mr. Raja was referring to. But for the fairness part, I have mostly found uh, there is a great value to the years of judicial experience which a judge uh, brings to the table. And that is where the equity part and the fairness part comes. Uh, if we could somehow marry that with a domain knowledge sector, so that's one area where I feel uh, clients would uh, prefer an institution and prefer a panel in that institution which has experience, sectoral experience in those sectors. So. If, if I could put a qu quick question back to you, what do you think about parties that you will sometimes see codifying qualifications of arbitrators in the arbitration agreement? Is this something to be avoided? So if you, if you were submitting a notice, would you propose qualifications if the parties can't agree, or do you sometimes see those ensconced qualifications? Sometimes it could become a little restrictive, because if you, have, if you put in too many qualifications, you, you better have people who have those qualifications in the first place. So, uh, but yeah, uh, broadly, if they, if they could be indicators and pointers as to uh, some broad uh, pointers as to the basic qualification that they should have. For example, uh, uh, again, I personally prefer to have a person with a law degree, as in a lawyer to be an arbitrator. There's a great debate as to the fact that uh, being a lawyer is not a necessary qualification that an arbitrator need to have, especially for technical arbitrations. But, uh, so things like that, so broad parameters, but not too, too specific, which would make finding an arbitrator a, a, a difficult proposition in the Indian context. Mm. 
Pranav, what, what about you? You've, you've worked at Magic Circle firms, worked, worked at SIC, so you know the landscape quite well. What about a new emerging sectors appointment, say, of non-lawyers that happen to be sector uh, specialists? How much stake should the parties have in this appointment process when the institution is called upon to make the appointment? Uh, Kevin, I completely agree with Chris here. That's the, uh, if, we, if we start mentioning any qualifications in the arbitration agreement itself, <clears throat> that, that makes the, as it is, I was complaining about the pool of arbitrators being very limited, then we are further restricting the pool. And that is uh, uh, something which I think so can be avoided. But at the same time, I also agree that what is important for, for the clients and what is important for us as counsel as well, that we have an arbitrator who understands the entire procedure and the mechanism really, really well. Now, for example, the appointment of an emergency arbitrator, as per the SIEC rules as well, it should at least be someone who is able to understand what is the role of an emergency arbitrator. It is not for, it's not for him to conduct the entire trial, but it is only for, for the person, for the tribunal, for the emergency arbitrator to determine whether there is actually an emergency and whether the, the particular relief which is being sought as an emergency is, is valid or not valid. That is the restrictive role. Now, what we, what we as counsel as well as the clients, of course, by extension, that's, that's exactly what we desire, that the appointment of a, a tribunal from an institution would be of someone who already is aware of all these best practices, all these procedures, and, and uh, whatever the rules also entail. And that is where I think so it go, goes back to my first point that maybe a little bit of more uh, expectation and a desire from the institutions would be that yes, in case the arbitrator or the tribunal is wavering in, in implementing the perfect procedure, the institution is, about, is, is able to come in to keep a check and balances uh, in place. So, so that, that is something I think so which, uh, which again institutions can play a more pivotal role in, in being that administering authority, being, that, be, being the big brother who's watching the entire arbitration. You, you know, with, without attribution in our pre-panel call, we had one of the panelists ask, uh, well, what do, you, what do you guys actually do? And uh, I will say when it comes to the appointment of arbitrators, we spend an enormous amount of time on the appointment of arbitrators, and particularly VK when it comes to appointing a first-time arbitrator. It's very easy to appoint someone that has a track record and is able, we know that this person can marshal an arbitration. It's more difficult when we're appointing, say, a younger arbitrator, a third or fourth chair that served as counsel in an SIC arbitration. But this is something that, that we take very seriously and spend an enormous amount of time on. Uh, but let's say the appointment of the arbitrator went slightly incorrectly. Uh, Arjun, could you talk about uh, challenges to arbitrators? What are those relevant fa factors for an Indian seated arbitration, a Singapore seated arbitration, and an SIC arbitration? And maybe any comments on the difference between objections on a disclosure and then a challenge proper? So I think the first thing, uh, the first and the, one of the major reasons for uh, problems with challenges is, and the reason why I think particularly in the Indian context you have challenges is, uh, lack of information. Lack of information about the arbitrator's track record, about uh, who has nominated them in what arbitration. I understand that most likely awards themselves will be confidential. But I think it would be useful if institutions can put out a little more information about what arbitrators have done in the past and uh, about awards themselves without, uh, without compromising on confidentiality. That said, I think really uh, challenges, really as far as institutional arbitration are concerned, arise at, at two stages, according to me. Uh, in my experience, at the nomination stage, so when one party nominates the arbitrator, because all appointments are subject to, uh, all nominations are subject to appointment by the uh, SIAC, uh, it's possible to raise uh, an objection as soon as the person is nominated, although this is not a requirement of the rules. Uh, in my experience, this may actually obviate uh, a, a later delay uh, rather than waiting for the appointment. At the second stage, of course, once the, uh, once the tribunal is appointed, there's a distinction here between, of course, Indian law where the tribunal itself decides on the, uh, the challenge whereas in SIAC, the SIAC court decides on the challenge. Um, another interesting point of divergence with actually uh, 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 those who are uninitiated may not realize is that 
they, we have, of course, the IBA guidelines on uh, the orange list, the green list, and the red list, and so on. In India, we have basically adopted the IBA guidelines, but with some important tweaks. For instance, we have the seven schedule, which is basically uh, a red list, but it's waivable. Then we have something called the fifth schedule. Now, the seventh schedule objection can be taken directly before a court. Uh, the fifth schedule objection has to be taken before the arbitrators, or in this case, the SIC court, uh, if it's governed by SIC. What is not very clear is, because we don't have a categorization into red or orange and so on, as to what is the nature of the, uh, what would happen if the facts are established. If it's established that yes, this is a case which falls within the orange list, would that immediately automatically mean that this is a case where uh, the arbitrator uh, should step down? So this is something which is statutory required or is an interesting point in Indian law which diverges from the IBA guidelines at some level. So uh, I think that there, this is uh, something that institutions should be aware about also. And I'm sure you have competent counsel who uh, will be able to brief the SIAC as and when uh, the need arises. Um, the last thing is, of course, uh, the duty or the, or the need to give reasons. In an Indian arbitration, uh, when there is a challenge which the SIC court has, has, to, has to decide, I, I understand that the rules themselves don't necessarily require reasons to be given. They do. Uh, but because it's subject to challenge, uh, I think the SIC would definitely would give reasons in all these cases. Um, Sheila, VK, do you want to weigh in on, on your process for uh, disclosures, of course, you guys sit frequently as, as an arbitrator. And one thing that we sometimes try to communicate is when an arbitrator accepts an appointment subject to disclosure, that arbitrator is already saying that I consider myself to be independent and impartial, but I make the following disclosures for good order. And then the institution uh, has to marshal the comments and then decide what to do, particularly in that area of the orange list. What is, what is your process for full and frank disclosure and accepting appointments? I, th I think most of us would always err on the side of over rather than under disclosure. So you're right, um, Kevin, in the sense um, uh, when you say I'm ready to sit, um, you think that there are certain amber areas uh, which you think fall on the right side of the line, but you ought to disclose. But I, I, I must say the SIAC, from my interactions with them, have... Um, uh, adopted uh, a pragmatic and fair view, and I, I, I would say my experience with that, not for myself, but um, in, from, through what I've learned from interactions with others, uh, has um, uh, done a more than good job in, in this area. I, I, I think I'd largely agree with that. Um, and actually to Arjun's point about um, having more visibility, I feel like until such time as there can be that mechanism from the institutions, and even as that's sort of growing, because I know institutions do think about that, um, the onus is on the arbitrator, right? Because you don't want to be in a position where um, the knowledge was there and you just didn't share it. And particularly, like, m my position in a law firm is, you know, there's, a, there's an initial layer of internal conflict searches which often leads to, you know, a nice Friday evening of, right, let me now go through these three pages and work out whether I can actually take this appointment. Um, and there's always relationships somewhere. And actually, I'd like to say that um, doing that process for yourself, like thinking about not just the technical conflict, but the commercial conflict, and then also the potential personal conflict, which sometimes people don't think about. But when we think about how um, small, how large the country is in India, for instance, and how much arbitration Singapore sees, but at the end of the day, how small these communities are, I always err on the side of disclosing absolutely everything. Um, and sometimes I do think, well, you know, have I seen someone else do that? And often the answer is not always. Like I do see people adopt a little bit of a measured approach and it's not wrong at the end of the day, especially the personal conflict, it's not necessary to, to always disclose. But I always feel it's better to err on the side of caution. And I also think that the, it's fair to the parties because 
the parties at that point have to take a decision on whether they object or not. Otherwise, if something comes to be known later, that challenge procedure is just unfair. It's unfair inefficiency on the parties that's directly created by the arbitrator, and I think that's really unfortunate. If, if I could put the thorny question back to you, do you think the standard for confirmation should be the same for a party-nominated arbitrator who has a disclosure? What if the institutional appointment of a sole arbitrator has the very same disclosure again in the orange list? Is the standard the same? Because it seems untidy if it's not, but then there's also that fundamental right to be able to nominate an arbitrator, choose your decider. Uh, what, do you, what do you think and what do you say to that? I think it absolutely should be the same <laughs> because it's, it's, at the end of the day, it may be that it's a party appointed arbitrator and we always tell our clients, you know, when they say, right, this is the fun bit, who should we pick who's going to take our side? They don't always say that, but you know, you always have the odd client. And it is our role to explain, no, no, that's not the idea. The idea is that you put a decision maker there who you trust will reach the right decision wearing a hat of, surprise, surprise, independence and impartiality. So I think that, and I have been in a situation actually where there was an obvious personal conflict on the other side and we knew that there was a really, really close proximity between the party and their appointed arbitrator, not SIAC actually, and there's a reason why I disclosed that up front. I, I found SIAC to be very rigorous and contrary to my you know, warning to you. Actually, my honest view is that you guys do a fantastic job of that. But there is another institution where I did have this experience. We actually did mount a challenge and we found ourselves in a very difficult position. We had to gather lots of evidence. At the end of it, we lost. And we felt that was wholly unfair because it's so obvious in a very small community that there was a real personal conflict. And I think that arbitrators don't, you know, sometimes, both the arbitrators and the parties, with the hats of the institution, there has to be that rigor. Well, we're excellent at that because of Lucy Reed, Toby Landau, and Kavinder Bull that are deciding these very difficult questions on whether or not we'd proceed with the confirmation. VK, just a, a quick question to you. If you accepted an appointment, made a disclosure, and a party objected to your appointment, do you think that the disclosing arbitrator should have an opportunity to respond if the institution, institution decides not to confirm? Uh, that's... Um a difficult question to answer because it depends on the nature of the objection. Um, but uh, I would think that most arbitrators, if uh, objection is made on an uh, arguable point, would recuse themselves because you wouldn't want to impose yourself in an arbitration where one party has no confidence in you. And I, I would say uh, that the vast majority of arbitrators I've sat with in the last few years take their responsibilities very seriously. Unfortunately, and that's the reality of life, statistically, there are a small number of arbitrators who perhaps see their role, and let me be diplomatic here, in articulating their appointer's case uh, differently from um, that arbitrators, the rest of us, have come to expect. You know, historically, in the US, until 2002, uh, there was no such thing as neutral arbitrators. And then the ABA changed their rules. And even today, um, different standards are practiced because many US firms seek to interview the arbitrators on the basis of trying to find their expertise. But I'm told, and so far, I've refused to be interviewed. Uh, I'm told that there's questions sometimes steer the arbitrators in a particular uh, direction. So uh, the international community has not come down hard on this. And that's something to be looked at. Because I think if you have been interviewed, you need to make disclosure um, so that both the institution and the opposing party knows. And I think you should even disclose what um, the interview was about. So uh, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm raising this because I think this is something that has not really been properly addressed in international forums. Um, let, 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 uh, we're running out of time. If you don't mind, can I make some observations? L let, let me say that I think the institutions play a key role, and not just in appointments. Appointments is one of the several facets or several roles that they play. I think they also have a role um, in keeping and ensuring that standards are maintained. How do they do this? Partly 
through the appointments, but also through their interactions, through continuing education. And I have a radical suggestion. The radical suggestion is make continuing education mandatory for all arbitrators on your panel. Um, and, uh, you know, things keep changing. Take, for example, the Indian decision. Um, uh, chloro was, broke new law. It went beyond the French decisions in terms of uh, um, how you could join parties uh, that were from a similar entity. And now the Indian courts have said, okay, let's think about it carefully. Let's take a step backwards. Due process issues. Different seats have different standards for um, uh, lack of impartiality. The Halliburton case need not necessarily be followed in other jurisdictions. So these are the conversations that the arbitral community and institutions need to regularly have. So that's my first radical suggestion. My second suggestion is this, and this is something I wrote about five years ago. Make subscribing to ethical standards optional, not compulsory. Why do I say this? I've had cases where there were American parties and Singapore and or British English parties or solicitors, solicitors, not parties. And the ethical rules on witness interfacing are very different. The Singapore and the British and the Australian advocates have their hands tied when it comes to interacting with their witnesses. The Americans have a more liberal view as to how they can interact. So in theory and in fact, it's not an even playing field. And I think institutions have a role. But I'm not in favor of making it mandatory, but I'm making it optional. If both parties agree, then I think the institutions should actually publish a list of standards that they expect, not just of arbitrators, but of counsel. Next, and this is a challenge. I wish to ask institutions to consider, and I, I'm doing it elsewhere at the same time. Publish KPIs. As how, as how long would you normally, you don't need to bind yourself because they're always exceptional cases, but how long would you normally take to complete an appointment process? How long would you take to deal with a challenge? How long would you take to deal with a joint application? How long would you take to deal with your scrutiny process? Uh, I, I, th I think there are certain expectations. It is not good enough, let me be very frank, to say as soon as practical, as soon as possible. It is not good enough because it does leaves us unclear as to when this might happen. And arbitrators also have other commitments. And surprisingly, arbitrators also take leave from time to time. <laughs> so. Um, Think about this. Um, I say this with the best of intentions, and may I say, as someone who was here at the beginning of the relationship or the marriage I talk about, I want to congratulate the SIC and the current team uh, for doing exceptionally well. Uh, and the, the turnout of the audience here is uh, impressive. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, un under, under the SIC rules, the registrar has broad powers to extend time, and on the basis of the exceptional circumstances, the, the timer only came up halfway, because uh, I wanted to go to Krish, uh, if we could, and I've saved the hard questions for you. On, we've, we've talked about uh, the potential of India as an arbitration jurisdiction. What do you see as the future of Indian arbitration in the next five years and ten years, and how can we get where we want to go? Yeah. So. Uh so let's, uh, let's say the same question that you asked me 10 years back. So the reason why India exported so much of arbitration to Singapore was that uh, first uh, it was perceived that we don't have a pro-arbitration court. The, 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 the higher judiciary were not very pro-arbitration, they were very interventionist. And those were the reasons why uh, many, many arbitrations went outside India. That factor has changed substantially. And uh, I, I would go on to say that not only the, the legislature has changed that, uh, but even the courts, both in their judgments and outside in conferences as these, you would find uh, the higher judiciary very expressly saying that, no, we need to be very pro-international arbitration. Uh, a distinction has been made between international arbitration and domestic arbitration. In India, we have a problem of plenty. 
we have uh, f four, five major arbitration institutions already in different cities. Uh, so uh, I believe between them there would be some healthy competition. But uh, and and SIAC of course is is leading that race. Uh, before coming to this conference, I checked up how many awards of SIAC has been set aside by the Supreme Court and High Court. I couldn't find one. So uh, you, you you may correct me on that. We we can't either, but we're still attempting to prove that neg negative negative. Uh, but that is a, a stunning figure when you consider that's the That's absolutely of awards. stunning, and uh, I think that's. Uh, and, and that's an exception. I checked all the other institutions, ICC, uh, the international institutions, LCIA, and there have been at least one award that has been set aside, but for SIAC I couldn't find one. So I think that's a tremendous achievement. And um, going forward uh, for India, I think there would have to be, uh, there would be, users will have to decide uh, between the institutions whether to go for SIAC, which uh, it's still perceived as a, as a Singaporean out, as in Singaporean center. Uh, so maybe SIAC would have to consider having an outpost in India, in Delhi. Uh, otherwise, you will have three, four other local institutions chasing you. Uh, so that's one. Secondly, in terms of uh, the future, I see a lot of uh, tech-based disputes coming up, um, the blockchain, metaverse, uh, of course, Right now, the regulatory regime regarding cryptocurrency is in limbo, as far as India is concerned. But uh, very soon, we are expecting a code to come up, and uh, the dispute meca resolution mechanism would be arbitration in those uh, primarily, which will be cross-border, uh, multi-border disputes. Uh, alternative fee models, I think that's something which India will need to look at. Uh, I think Singapore, um, uh, the minister mentioned, uh, uh, introduced a uh, uh, contingent fee model earlier this year. Hong Kong has just followed suit. I think just uh, last month Hong Kong has introduced that. Uh, they have in, in fact even uh, broadened the, the, uh, the uh, they have introduced an outcome based uh, fee model and damage based fee model which is quite interesting. I don't know whether Sheila will take it up but uh, so, so these are the areas where I feel uh, ESG related issues um, we see ESG clauses coming into commercial contracts, and that's one area, climate change, where we'll find a lot of uh, disputes happening, all international. So, uh, so I see these are the areas where we, uh, where India is headed. Pranav, you had some thoughts. Uh, uh, so, Kevin, indeed, I, again, I find myself agreeing with my fellow panelists a lot here. Uh, but absolutely, the, the, I think so. The the future of the arbitration landscape in India is going to continue to remain very, very exciting as it has been evidenced and witnessed uh, in the past decade. Uh, Indian Arbitration Act saw extensive amendments in the year 2015 and then 2018 and then 2019. I think so being the only act which has been amended uh, so extensively in such a short pa a span of time. Thus the importance of arbitration and the entire landscape has not been lost. The quality of judgments which is coming out of the Delhi High Court, the Bombay High Court is, is excellent now. But it's not just only a question of pro-arbitration judgments, it's a question of interpreting the entire arbitration process correctly and how it has been desired and as compared to other jurisdictions as well. And what I would like to in fact uh, compliment SIAC on is, is it is the scrutiny process which I think so is instrumental in not even a single award uh, having been set aside uh, because and that would continue to become and continue to rise to be very, very important going forward as well as arbitration further sophisticates in this particular part of the world. Uh, the role of the institution and the, specifically the role of the scrutiny process which the Secretariat undertakes is going to become further extremely important to see less number of awards uh, being challenged in the Indian courts. So the overall I, I feel the, the entire outlook is extremely positive and will continue to remain positive, especially in light of the entire economic changes and the economic climate and the relationship which has been fostering between various jurisdictions as well. Thanks, Pranav. And I guess I would add from that scrutiny process, where we have our advantage is having Indian board members, four Indian court members, and two Indian qualified lawyers in, in the Secretariat, because if you have uh, an Indian seated arbitration, arbitration SIC administered, or we anticipate enforcement is going to India. You want to have those Indian uh, specialists. And if I could call Arjun, Sheila, and then finishing with VK, 
any closing thoughts on the challenges in international arbitration? Uh, we always crystal ball gaze or any of the topics that we took on today? Uh, so I think two things, of course. Diversity is going to be a major challenge and I must commend SIAC because I personally know of one SIAC appointment where they have appo appointed a South Asian uh, woman uh, in, as a sole arbitrator in a, in a tribunal. Uh, the second uh, thing which is again, I think is going to be a huge challenge for institutions in general and perhaps SIAC as well is uh, arbitration seated in India which are still largely ad hoc. I think there's a, as uh, Pranav had pointed out, there's a definite trend towards institutionalization and what can SIAC do to, uh, you know, build on that trend and bring its service office offering at perhaps at a lower cost for a different kind of market and, you know, have a, a different, uh, some thought on, on fees, on, our, uh, on the fee structure and whether you can cater to a, a different kind of Indian audience which would generally go to the ad hoc, um, uh, to an ad hoc arbitration. Just two quick thoughts from me, Kevin. Um, the first is, uh, I mean, SIAC is, it's just unprecedented what it's achieved, I would say, in India, but also more widely in Asia now, actually. And um, wherever you go, uh, every, everybody talks about how they can be more like SIAC or just continue to choose SIAC for reasons that we then, we then tell them. Um, but but the, two, the two points are, one is time. I really do think that particularly if you look at India as the base, what the, the I think the main uh, legislative change that everyone talked about is the 12 plus six months of the domestic seated arbitrations and everybody then thought actually maybe foreign proceedings are very slow then in comparison because there is some pressure now on the ground. And I do think that um, that view is still there. And what can a foreign seat bring? I mean, leaving aside the choice of why you would pick uh, an Indian versus foreign seat, I think procedural rigor has to continue to be one of the reasons. And I still maintain that the institution can have more control over that um, and can continue to. I think you'll find that if you look at the rules and continue to sharpen them and, and have the tribunal kind of enforce it as well, then you know I, I think by and large people will think that's actually a very positive development because there's just more rigor in the process. That's the first, and it, you know, as, as part of that rigor is of course the very, I think, strong scrutiny process, which I very much agree with to Pranav's comment. I think the second one is just to Krishnan's point is specialist arbitrators. Actually going to Mr. Raj's point about diversity and choice of arbitrators, one of the things that I grew up learning is if you have a finance related dispute, then the pool of arbitrators that LCI had back in the day was you know, unbeatable, and everybody just kept saying that. And then if you had an Asian financial dispute back in the GFC, then Hong Kong was a good institution to provide a good choice of arbitrators. And then, you know, different th trends sort of caught on. And of course, for infra and energy, for instance, Singapore became much quicker in sort of establishing itself. I think if you look at it by sectors and build specialist arbitrators like that, then that recognition can be, can have wider reach as well uh, beyond Asia. <laughs> but I think that is something that we lack actually. There are so many specialist disputes and crypto disputes have caught on here much quicker than elsewhere. But you know, where are the arbitrators? Who are they? So I think SIAC can take a bit of a role with specialist arbitrators um, in leading that charge. That's my second comment. Thank you. Uh, I, I know I, st I I'm prevent, I'm between you and the break, so I'll be very quick. So uh, first, the, the formula that the SIC has been using for the last decade or so works. I wouldn't fundamentally change it, but I would improve, I would innovate, and as I said, I am firmly of the view that the key consideration for the substantial users, those with big claims, is not cost, but efficiency. And I think if you're not careful about this, any institution, and I'm not talking about the SIC here, over time, if this becomes reinforced, um, it will have a corrosive effect, which cannot be repaired. So don't, past is not always prolonged. Uh, it rhymes but there's no certainty that the success of the last 20 years will repeat itself over the next 10 years. I, I think the friendship that the SIAC has had 
with the Indian arbitration community has helped a great deal. The integration of prominent Indian thought leaders into the SIC court and into the SIC mechanism has been important. But I would also urge the SIC, and I'm being very direct here, to be more transparent about what it does and the figures that it has. What it publishes now, like most other institutions, is fairly anodyne. Break away from this model and see yourself as real partners with your users. Uh, because if not, users always have a choice. Uh, on that note, um, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm really pleased to be back in India, especially after the two years of enforced absence. I think that says it for, for all of the panelists. We are delighted uh, to be back in India. Uh, and what I am most delighted about is to have this eminent group of panelists and the fact that we can all give them a round of applause instead of emojis or anything else. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to this panelist, and thanks for every, everyone for attending. <laughs>